Welcome to today's webinar, where I will be speaking with the independent MP for Wentworth, Allegra Spender, and also to Thomas Mayo and Kerry O'Brien about their book, The Voice to Parliament Handbook, and about the upcoming referendum. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where I work, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here online today. Let me start by giving you a little bit of background about each of our three speakers. Allegra Spender is the independent MP for Wentworth. She has an economics degree from Cambridge, an MSc from the University of London, as has completed business courses at Harvard. Before she became an MP last year, Allegra worked as a business analyst at McKinsey, a policy analyst with UK Treasury, and was later managing director of Carla Zampatti. Allegra was also the chair of the Sydney Renewable Power Company and CEO of the Australian Business and Community Network. And finally, very relevantly for today's purposes, we're going to be talking about this, Allegra is the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Welcome, Allegra. Thank you. Thomas Mayo is a Kaurareg Aboriginal and Kalkalgal Evobamal Torres Strait Islander man, born on Larrakia land in Darwin. In his 30s, he became a union official for the Maritime Union of Australia. He's the chairperson of the Northern Territory Indigenous Labour Network, advises the Diversity Council of Australia, and also the From the Heart campaign. In February 2017, and we're going to be talking about this as well, he participated in the Darwin Regional Dialogue. And in May 2017, he represented Darwin at the Uluru First Nations Constitutional Convention at Uluru, where the Uluru Statement, of course, was made. He is a signatory to the Uluru Statement and has been a tireless campaigner for The Voice ever since. Thomas has written five books before this. Uh, many of them are on The Voice and the Uluru Statement and has had essays published in The Guardian and the Sydney Morning Herald. Welcome, Thomas. Kerry O'Brien needs very little introduction, as they say. Kerry is one of Australia's most respected journalists with six Walkley Awards, including the Gold Walkley and the Walkley for Outstanding Leadership. In his many decades at the ABC, he has reported for This Day Tonight, Four Corners, presented Late Line for six years, 7.30 for 15 years, and Four Corners for five years. In that time, he's covered all of the major Indigenous issues of our time, including land rights, deaths in custody, Mabo, the Stolen Generations Inquiry, the birth and death of ATSIC, which we'll also be talking about today, the intervention and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. He was a member of the eminent panel advising the Queensland government on a path to treaty. Kerry, welcome. Nicole. Now I'm going to start Allegra with a few questions for you. You, I know, because I've asked you about this, have supported the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the Voice to Parliament since before you were elected. They were part of your campaign platform. Why will you be voting yes? And why will you be encouraging others to do the same? Well, it's a great way to start. Look, I'm, I'm voting yes, and I'm supporting this um, for two simple reasons. Um, and for me, it's about recognition and you know, listening to people um, who, whose lives are gonna be affected by policy. Um, recognition, because our constitution was written um, over a hundred years ago and there were no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people there, nor any recognition in the constitution of, the, of their care of land and, and their unique place in Australian history. And absolutely that needs to be changed. Um, but a consultation and, and having the opportunity really to hear um, what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people think um, will make a difference on you know laws and policies that affect them and you know this is you know for me this is pretty basic it's how I've you know worked in business it's how I've worked in not-for-profits you know if you are trying to make a difference you start by listening um, to the people that are affected by your decisions and understand what is important to them and what they think is going to make a difference and I think the Australian community really wants to um, close the gap really wants to have you know really positive um, policies uh, that support all of our country, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, but frankly, we don't have those policies aren't really effective right now, and it's because we're not listening. And I think this gives an opportunity for people really to to for 
me in, par in, in parliament, but also people in government and, and other departments to have a chance to get representations from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about what's important and affects them. I think that it's pretty simple to me. It's, um, and, and that's really where I'm, uh, that's why I'm so supportive of it. And I know so many people in Wentworth are as well. You are the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. What is that? What do you do? When do you meet? Yeah. Look, I think it's a group of parliamentarians, and it is across the spectrum, who have read the Uluru Statement from the Heart, um, who understand what a generous offer it is to Australian people. And I, I still remember the first time I read it, um, you know, I thought, oh, my gosh, it's going to be this long tome. And it's like, oh, my God, it's so short <laughs> and, and so beautifully written. And so I think it's such a wonderful symbol and wonderful words about what this country can be, but what it needs to do. Um, uh, to really move fully into its future, you know, where, as Noel Pearson says, the three parts of Australia, you know, are unique, um, continuous civil longest continuous civilization in the world, um, the, you know, the first part of the history of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, brothers and sisters, but also the British institutions and our, and our strong democracy and our multicultural Australia, you know, those are the three gen, you know, perfect parts of Australia. And we have an opportunity to, to come together with those three parts even more powerfully if we fully adopt the Uluru Statement of the Heart. So for me in, in Parliament, what that means is getting people together um, from not just, you know, politicians, but also staff and, and, and people from across, you know, parliamentary staff, but also political staff together and talk about what is um, most important in terms of really making um, that Uluru Statement from the Heart live and breathe. Um, and and, you know, and certainly some focus now has been on the voice um, because that was the first part of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And this is the part that we're focused on right now and is the part that I'm desperately keen to get up in this October, um, in the October, if it is October, um, the, uh, the referendum later this year. And without giving any names away, do you have participants from across the political spectrum in that group? Yeah, we do. Absolutely. And a short spoiler alert for listeners, you will be treated to hearing Thomas Mayo read or recite probably the Uluru Statement from the Heart towards the end of this session. If you haven't read it before, I urge you to do so. And when you hear Thomas read it, I think you couldn't fail to be moved by that. So yeah. stay around so that you get to hear that. Allegra, one final question for you for the moment. You have also convened and supported the group Wentworth for the Voice, of which I should say I'm a member, and the Thank you. Uh, seminar today is being held under those auspices. We are effectively a network of local individual, individuals, businesses, community groups and councils. Tell us a bit about the work that Wentworth for the Voice is doing. Look, the When for the Voice um, really came out of people in the community saying we're really passionate about the voice and we want what can we do to help make that happen. Um, and so what we said we'd do is um, convey, convene a group of um, real volunteers and now we have over 400 volunteers and so thank you Nicole for being one of them who are, uh, who are saying look you're out there to help. Some of them you know are getting involved in door knocking now when we've already door knocked over two and a half thousand doors and had a really positive response um, and some of them are you know involved in street stores and some of them will be get involved closer to the election and our principle really is look if you care about this referendum and, and you support um, the voice then it's time to not just do that privately it's time for you to do that publicly um, whether that just means talking to your friends and family or whether that means getting out there and volunteering um, and it really our objective in the Wentworth for the Voice is that everyone in the community is informed about the choice that we have and that's really our first approach is to say look um, you know as we're door knocking it's well you know do you need further information what you know do you have questions um, and we train all our volunteers so they are able to answer questions because, you know, this is about firstly getting informed, having a respectful conversation, but also really, I think, absolutely driving home that we get a positive um, outcome from, um, you know, from this referendum. So that's that's what we're going to do. And I know there are lots of these sorts of community groups out, sort of springing up across the community. And I'm also incredibly grateful to, to be honest, to all the people who have really driven this because, you know, we had the idea in the office, but they have absolutely up and run it. And I know a lot of people, they're not necessarily my supporters, they're supporters of this and they're using this as an opportunity to get together in their community and say, we want to make a change and we want to, you know, we want to write a new chapter in Australia's history um, and let's make sure this happens.
And this is an unabashed call out. If you're listening to this seminar or watching this seminar and you haven't already signed up to Wentworth for the Voice, there's an excellent website. You can do that. That will allow you to stay involved by newsletters and information. And if you want to get actively involved in ways that Allegra's talked about, whether it's knocking on doors, handing out flyers, or uh, just speaking to your friends and family, there's lots of suggestions there. Thank you. Thomas, I have some questions for you. You bring to the table a really unique perspective, and I love that. Um, about the Uru Statement and the Voice, because you were actually involved as a participant in the Darwin Regional Dialogue, which was held in February 2017. So that was one of 12 regional dialogues held all over Australia, organised by the Referendum Council. Um, people in the No Camp like to brand this as a Canberra Voice, but as you well know, it is anything but that. It comes from grassroots Indigenous communities. And I would like you to tell us, for people that don't know about how those regional dialogues worked, who attended them, from your eyewitness perspective, tell us a little bit about that regional dialogue that you participated in. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, the dialogues were, um, and the process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement was really unique. Uh, we had the opportunity as Indigenous people uh, in 2016-17 to have a well-resourced, uh, well-informed, Indigenous-led uh, process of dialogues um, with the great hope that we would reach a consensus on, on what the next steps forward are and what form of constitutional recognition we could accept. Uh, and those dialogues um, were well-formulated as well. They had 100 participants at each um, that was important not to exclude anybody, but there was a formula applied to ensure a cross-section of views and perspectives, um, that there was cultural authority in the room, uh, gender balance, youth involvement. Um, so it was, it was well formulated in that regard. It was Indigenous-led. Um, and, uh, and what we did at the Dialogues in Uluru was we considered, really, we, we considered the lessons from the past. So the things that had been tried over the, you know, the, the, the period of colonisation, um, previous statements and petitions. Uh, we also considered on uh, the representative bodies that we have established many times before, um, how they've all been silenced, uh, either by intimidation or, uh, you know, since the 1967 referendum established by one government and removed by the next. Um, so all of those lessons were learnt. Um, we brought our, our people together, uh, we considered um, the best steps forward and that's how the Uluru Statement was made. Um, on the morning of the 26th of May, uh, a really wonderful moment where uh, there was 250 of 270 of us remaining in the room, about 20 had walked out the day before. I'm going to stop you for one moment, Thomas, because I want to wind back a little bit just to take mm. people from that step, from the regional dialogue to the Constitutional Convention. So at the regional dialogue, correct me if I'm wrong, yep. you were presented with five different options for constitutional recognition. And each of the 12 regional dialogues independently, unanimously selected the voice as their preferred option for reform, right? That's correct. Uh, on the Referendum Council final report, you can find the uh, records, um, the evidence of uh, what were prioritised. Um, so treaty was one of them, the voice, uh, um, a statement of acknowledgement, so that's just symbolic recognition, which had no support, um, uh, changing the race power or amending the race power were others as well. And so the unanimous support was for the voice, absolutely. And then from those regional dialogues, so you're at the Darwin Regional Dialogues, there are 12 regional dialogues. You for Darwin, people are elected as delegates um, <coughs> from each of those regional dialogues, and then they attend the Constitutional Convention in May 2017. So you were elected as one of the representatives for Darwin. So you were there at the Constitutional Convention in May 2017. Before we actually get to the Uluru Statement, I'm going to ask you about that because I know that you made a speech before it was actually read out. Tell us a bit about the feeling I want to say in the room, but it was probably outdoors. There were some 250 delegates. You were representatives of these different regional dialogues. Uh, each of the 12 regional dialogues had reached um, a consensus position that the voice was the number one option for reform. Mm. Tell me about what it was like to be at that convention, what the sense of occasion was leading up to the Uluru Statement. Oh, I just remember a great sense of hope. You know, uh, I, I come from a union background. I understood the 
opportunity was uh, um, was one that uh, was very important to our progress that uh, to come together in the way that we were going to do at Uluru from all over the country. And I had asked the question in the process, actually, uh, in, a, in a trial dialogue in late 2016, I'd asked the question of mostly elders in the room uh, in Melbourne at the Melbourne University, it was, um, if there had been an opportunity like uh, that one before, and they said no, you know, not in such a well-resourced, truly, uh, you know, national region by region uh, opportunity like that. So yeah, it was a, a sense of hope um, that we could reach a, a consensus. There were naysayers, you know, people were saying because you know we are dehumanised uh, in, in, in um, several ways, and one of them is that. Um, you know, Indigenous people are just going to, you know, you get that many Indigenous people together, they're just going to have a screaming match and not be able to come to a consensus, um, you know, which is rubbish. Another one is that we we can't, uh, our voices have always been uh, failures, you know, our representative bodies, which isn't true as well, and we'll probably go to that in this discussion. Uh, you mentioned, uh, we'll talk about ATSIC. Um, but we did reach a consensus there, and it was difficult. It was hard work mm. um, bringing that many people together um, and, and trying to decide together what uh, you'll say to the rest of the country about the rule book, no less, mm. the rule book of this nation, you know, that, and, and how it will directly affect your people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It was hard work. And as I said, 250 of 270 were there on that final morning. 20 had walked out the, night before, the day before. We were a bit on, low on morale, but we kept doing the work. We continued the discussions. Um, and uh, I gave a speech just before the Uluru Statement was read for the first time by Professor Megan Davis. And, and really, I just presented this. What an amazing moment that must have been. Oh, uh, it was, you know, yeah, just to be in that room. It was a massive room. It was the, um, it's called the Uluru Meeting Place. Um, and it's at the Ulara Resort. And, uh, you know, this massive room. And on one side, there was this huge Aboriginal flag. On the other side, this massive Torres Strait Islander flag. And here I was, you know, a fellow that hadn't been involved in national, uh, you know, really national campaigns uh, before um, presenting uh, the strategy going forward, which was simply that first we would pursue a voice um, and so that we could have the best possible say on the Makarata Commission, which would supervise agreement making and truth telling to the nation. And then what was it like when Professor Megan Davis read out the Uluru Statement? Uh, what was the reception she got and how, how did you feel? Yeah, we all stood as one, um, endorsed it with standing acclamation, tears of joy and hope. I think I was one of the last to stand because I'd just done that speech and my, my legs were still shaking, you know, and I was just looking around in disbelief, you know, like, wow, we, we've done this, you know, and you know, I stood with everybody else and uh, I remember my face just being sore, my cheeks were sore from smiling all morning. Um, you know, our shoulders were wet from crying on each other's shoulders and everything. It was, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful moment. A political feat this country should celebrate forever. I almost don't want to ask the next question, but I will. How then did you feel when the Uluru Statement was rejected by the Liberal government led by then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, after I might say it had been endorsed by the Referendum Council? Yeah, it was like a slap in the face, you know, uh, all that hard work and not just the hard work of that uh, convention and those dialogues that I mentioned, but just the hard work by our ancestors and elders to learn all the lessons that went into it, um, you know, but one thing that we predicted was that it would uh, be likely that it would be dismissed to begin with because, you know, it wasn't just symbolic reform, it was a, it's a form of recognition that gives our people greater fairness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there were expectations that we would support just symbolic reform. But we know there's a, there's a real problem. Uh, you know, the statistics that are the closing the gap, uh, that make up the closing the gap uh, efforts, um, you know, uh, are our lives, you know, and our families and our communities. So there is a real problem that we should be ashamed of as Australians, that Proportionately, we have the most incarcerated people on the planet, that rheumatic heart disease and uh, diabetes, you know, preventable diseases uh, that exist, uh, well, with rheumatic heart disease, you know, don't exist anywhere else in the country other than Aboriginal communities, I think it is. Um, you know, we need to do something different. Uh, we need to do something that's more than symbolism. And, uh, and so 
we predicted that it would be dismissed because also because of all the other statements and petitions before it that were dismissed and ignored. Um, so we wrote the honorary statement to the Australian people. Yes. Let's go to that next point. Um, it is addressed to the Australian people. It's not addressed to the politicians. And that was a very deliberate choice. Why did you make that choice? Not you, well, not you collectively. Yeah, because, because firstly, because of the history of statements and petitions that were addressed to kings or queens or the federal parliament that were dismissed and ignored. But then also because the uh, voice requires a referendum. So to change the constitution, uh, we need a referendum uh, and, um, and it will be the Australian people ultimately that decide uh, if they accept the invitation in the Uluru Statement. So that's, uh, it was the first step. Final question for you for the time being, what does a voice to parliament mean to you? Well, it means, uh, for me, it means change, you know, uh, it means fairness to get changes that are important um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because as I said, these are more than statistics. We're talking about real lives, people that I personally know and love, people that I know that have passed on early because of those preventable diseases uh, and traumas that we carry from generation to generation, um, failed policies and harmful laws. Um, but also um, for all Australians, you know, that we should unify uh, in our constitution over 60,000 years of continuous heritage, heritage and culture. Um, for my non-Indigenous friends, you know, uh, I know that this is something that they will celebrate. I know it's something that our children will celebrate if we achieve it in this generation, um, that we became uh, not a country of merely just over 200 years of history, but one um, with many millennia of history. Kerry, I'll come to you next. Just before I do, I should mention that at the end of our discussion, there will be 10 or 15 minutes time for questions. So if people want to send questions in, we won't get to all of them, but we will get to some of them. And we will also, as a group, be discussing what I'll be doing is putting to you some of the questions or challenges that are raised by people who have concerns or who are in the no camp, and I'll be asking you what your answers are. Kerry, you write in your... So that I should... If people don't already have this wonderful book, I can't recommend it highly enough. If you can still get hold of one, I know that it's been selling far and wide. It's small. It's easy to pop in your handbag. I think as one of you says in the book, it's easy to put in the post to any of your relatives who are undecided or possibly leaning against yes. In that wonderful book, Kerry, you make the point, um, which I just asked Thomas about. One remarkable thing about the Uluru Statement is that it is addressed to the to the people of Australia and not to the politicians. Why do you think it was done that way and what's the impact of that? Well, I suppose you could say uh, at, at least a couple. I, I, think, I think it was a, a very clear signal, a very clear signal that, that to go forward as one nation, uh, recognising, as uh, Allegra said earlier, the, the three the three fundamental parts of our history coming together as one great narrative. Um, but so, so that the invitation, this generous invitation, going straight to the Australian people, um, because we are the people who will determine uh, whether this is accepted into the Constitution or not. Uh, but secondly, it was a very deliberate signal that said, politicians have failed us for generation after generation after generation. And that has been at different times, politicians uh, on both sides of that kind of broad spectrum, political spectrum, that is conservative and, uh, and uh, if you want to say progressive for want of better terminology. Um, and that is a very strong, a very strong element here. Uh, and it's, uh, which makes it even more uh, objectionable to me uh, that that many of those who are on the no side uh, of this argument uh, have tried to paint it as the exact opposite of that. In other words, uh, not only is it an invitation to the is it not an invitation to the parliament to pick it up and and implement it, uh, it it has come absolutely the raw it has come from Indigenous Australians. You heard Thomas 
talk about the, the democratic nature of that whole process and the consultative nature of that whole process within the limits of, uh, of the time that they had to do it and the money and the resources that they had to conduct it. Um, but but um, uh, we're told from the No campaign that this would be a voice from Canberra. Mm. It is the exact opposite. Mm. It would be a voice from grassroots, the grassroots of communities right around Australia, and most particularly and most importantly, from those regions and those remote areas where the gaps are greatest, the gaps of inequity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia across a range of all of those, those fundamental things that make us a civil society, things like health, things like education, literacy, and so on, like, like housing, like infrastructure, like jobs, uh, like de de developing, developing capacity within communities for those communities to, to a substantial degree support themselves and to have access to the same services as that the rest of us have taken for granted for all of our lives. So, so that, um, that I think addresses your question, Nicole. It is very deliberately uh, designed as a voice to the, to the parliament uh, that will give voice to communities that have not been listened to for generations. I mean, I, um, as a journalist of more than 50 years now, who, who way back in the early 1970s took a particular interest and a special and ongoing interest in reporting on Indigenous affairs uh, for, for very strong reasons. Uh, I, have seen, uh, I have seen the full sort of history of, of, uh, of how Indigenous policy has been developed from government to government, how particular, uh, starting with the Whitlam government in 1972, how there was a voice to parliament deliberate voice to parliament, 41 indigenous delegates were elected from different communities uh, and they were designed to come to Canberra representing indigenous people to give exactly this kind of expression on policy. So they, they were able to function, but they immediately struck resistance from white bureaucrats and largely white politicians who were not used to hearing or uh, from indigenous people, let alone asking them what they thought. So, so they had some limited effect in those early years, uh, but there was a lot of resistance. But the important thing is, as Thomas said in, in brief, from government to government to government to government, the voice would change. The voice would be changed. It might be weakened. There might be an attempt to strengthen it. And that's, it was an attempt in the Hawke-Keating years to strengthen a voice to, to Parliament. And that voice was very effective in a lot of ways. It developed some problems. But instead of addressing those problems, John Howard scrapped it mm. uh, with the support of the Mark Latham-led mm. Labor Party in 2004. So that's, a, that's something we'll come to later when a, a lot of people are asking the question, why does this body have to be enshrined in the Constitution? Why can't it just be legislated by Parliament? And the, the simplest answer to that is, isn't it? Because if you legislate a body like that, it can be wiped out with a change of government. And that's exactly what happened with ATSIC. Yeah. So, so what, 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 uh, what we now will be voting on uh, is, is the proposal of a body that would be enshrined in the Constitution and therefore its permanent place uh, as an institution in this country's history, its democracy and its government would be guaranteed. And, and yes, it is the parliament ultimately that retains the power to determine what form that voice would take. And that's fair enough because the parliament is uh, our main um democratic uh democratically elected body to determine how this country is run uh, run in in tandem in in the framework of the constitution um so uh, so the the voice would have the capacity to represent the communities that elect the people who will make up the voice uh but but they have they have no power uh, to enforce any of these poly any of their any of their um, uh, representations, other than the force of their arguments, the quality of their advice, and the integrity of their advice coming from indigenous communities, uh, and the moral, and and the moral and political power. Sorry, the moral and political power that will come from a yes vote in the constitution, which will be very hard for politicians to ignore. So they can they can they can. They can play with the uh, with the voice. They can change it from time to time, 
Uh, and from time to time, change will be necessary. That's true of every institution we've got. Uh, they, they, you might tinker with the form. You might make particular, might quite make quite important changes to improve the body. So the body could be improved over time. It could evolve over time, but it cannot be dismissed uh, in the way it has been in the past. One of the things you say in the book that that now seems a little superseded, sadly, I'm assuming you wrote most of it a few months ago, you specifically say we mustn't allow the debate on the referendum to descend into destructive, polarised politics. How, it, I think we'd all have to acknowledge that it has descended into that. Is that something that surprises you? Does it disappoint you? And how can we elevate it? How can we, how can we get it? It was always, as we've talked about, intended by Indigenous people to be a decision for the people, not the politicians. Uh, they didn't expect it to be as mired in politics as it has been. Does that surprise you? And how can we turn that around? Well, I don't think it's been quite as mired in politics as it could have been, because I don't think that both sides have, uh, have descended to, to, I think, a base level of political discussion. This, this whole process is political. Of course it is. People are being asked to vote to change the constitution. And it requires an act of parliament to allow the referendum to go ahead. Of course the political parties need to be engaged in this, but it is fundamentally led by the indigenous people uh, through Uluru. Um, so uh, I think that, that by and large, uh, the yes campaigners have endeavored to stay above the fray uh, and to focus on the positive elements of this. But of course, when you have uh, recurring fundamental criticisms that try to that that try to distort what it is, that try to misrepresent what it is, of course we have to respond to that. We and 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 in the main, I think we've responded by explaining the ways it's wrong. There's been a bit of name calling from the yes side. I think there's been some emotion, which is entirely understandable after the efforts that the effort that's gone into getting it this far but uh, and when you get a, a a straight untruth like it will be a third chamber of parliament or the voice will have a veto over the parliament those are just plain lies mm -hmm. they're not misunderstandings mm -hmm. they are lies and when there's a concerted effort on the no side uh, to incite fear amongst ordinary people that somehow or other this voice which will have no strength beyond the force of its arguments is somehow going to bring uh, the government to its knees uh, and clog up the the uh, the court system with specious claims but uh, the 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 most credible uh, and the most eminent constitutional experts in this country former members uh, of the high court including two chief justices um the, the preeminent um, uh, academic constitutional experts, uh, experts who have practiced, you know, day after day uh, in front of the High Court, there is, there is a very strong, very strong response which says that those arguments are a nonsense. And that also includes the Solicitor General of Australia, the second most, uh, most uh, uh, eminent um, uh, law officer in the country, who is appointed on a non-partisan basis. Uh, and, uh, and he says, the Solicitor General says that the voice to Parliament uh, will not uh, pose a problem to the, to the Constitution. It will strengthen the Constitution. It will, in, it will, it will um, oh God, I've forgotten the word, but it essentially means the same thing. It will strengthen, yes. enhance. It'll enhance the Constitution and strengthen our democracy. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't get any simpler than that. And I, and I think in pointing out that these things are wrong from the no campaign, I don't think we're descending to a kind of unacceptable level. But I, but, 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 uh, and, and you see, to me, there are these two strands. One is the politicians having their arguments, and then there is the public engagement between those people who are out there in force. Now, over 20,000 volunteers around the country supporting the Yes campaign in so many different ways. Uh, and the no campaigners, who I think are mostly trying to run their campaigns through social media and by appealing to the mainstream media. Kerry, I want to come back to your point about misinformation, and I certainly wasn't intending to suggest that the yes side of the case had descended into polarised politics. That remark was more directed, obviously, at the no side of the case. There's been a but couple I of... I to come comments. back to the point about misinformation. Um, as you said, there's a lot of misinformation being spread by the no campaign. 
deliberately, it seems, talk about this being a voice for the elite, a Canberra voice, and the insidious sort of underlying comment that a lot of Indigenous people don't support it, when in fact the latest survey shows that 83% of Indigenous people do support it. What role does the media have in relation to holding the No campaign to account, in relation to fact-checking and correcting misinformation? I would say not a, not what role it has, but what responsibility it has. It has the same responsibility that it has uh, in reporting anything. It should be accurate. Uh, it should act uh, as a as uh, an independent scrutineer uh, of honesty within our political process and on something as important and as pivotal as the the voice to government and parliament. Uh, I would expect that it would apply uh, absolute rigor to its reporting, and I have not in the main see that. But but uh, you, you talked about, you, you mentioned elitism. This stuff about, about how the, the Indigenous people who are, to some degree, leading this campaign uh, are elitist, and by being elitist, that removes them. You know, it's never entirely spelt out what, what, a, what a critic means when they try to when they try to denigrate someone as an elitist. Marcia Langton, who has been uh, an activist and a voice uh, for Indigenous rights uh, from, the, 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 from her very young adult years. I first met Marcia in Canberra in the 1970s. She's been utterly consistent from a very young age. Here's, what Mar here's how Marcia Langton herself described her upbringing. We were incredibly poor, the poorest of the poor, there were several periods when we didn't live in an actual house. As a child, I lived for a period of time in a native camp. Shelters made from bush timber and old sheets of metal, corrugated iron dirt floors. One of my jobs was to find firewood and cart water from the creek. That is Marcia Langton elitist. Now, somebody like Marcia, who was raised in those circumstances, and who somehow manages to break the shackles of the poverty that she was born into, to raise herself to the status that she enjoys today as a, an immensely respected academic with disciplines that take her across a range of fields, who has been utterly consistent in her support and her passion uh, to elevate the place of Indigenous people in this country, who to this day continues to visit the poorest of these Indigenous communities and the most marginalised of these people, to call her an elitist, as if it's a pejorative term, is to me an absolute disgrace, an utter disgrace, and probably the thing that makes me angriest uh, around this campaign. And I've seen it done before. I've seen it used in different ways in politics to denigrate people by calling them elitist. Cathy mm -hmm. Freeman is one of the most elite politicians that we have ever had and produced in this country. And all of us uh, who were anywhere above the age of five in Australia when she won the gold medal for the 400 metres in the Sydney Olympics, bathed in her elitism. <laughs> so at a certain point, when Cathy reached the absolute pinnacle of, of her sporting um, prowess, what was it about her that rendered her somehow uh, less respected because she was an elite? You know, the, the, the idea that somebody is elevated so high that they lose contact with everyone below them. I think that's what these naysayers want us to, to believe about these people. It is the opposite. It is the opposite. I want to now put to all of you, um, we've got about 10 minutes before we go to questions. I'm going to put to you some of the questions that are being asked by people who uh, either have legitimate concerns about the voice or who are trying to create mischief. There are answers, I know, to most of these questions, and I just have picked a few. You deal with them, Kerry and Thomas, in your book. Allegra, you deal with them on your website. Thomas, I'm going to ask you about this one. A lot of people say this is just symbolic. How is it going to actually make a practical difference to the lives of Indigenous Australians? And something that's come out recently, in July, we've seen the latest Closing the Gap report from the Productivity Commission, and we've seen that there are worsening outcomes for Indigenous people in terms of early childhood development, adults in prison, children in out-of-home care. What do you say, Thomas, to people who say this won't make a practical difference, it's just symbolic? Well, having a say about the decisions made about you is, is far more than symbolic. It's just, uh, it, I mean, it is fairness. Um, and it gets results. 
Now, there's there's great uh, swathes of evidence out there uh, about where um, programs or policies have been developed with Indigenous people and you get good results. The problem is, is that when you have good programs and policies, much like your voice is always destroyed, you tend to get a government come along and reset or, you know, take it back to square one and uh, all worse, um, and you start all over again. So a consistent um, voice that is backed by the Australian people. So the Australian people saying uh, to all future parliaments that they should, you know, listen to what Indigenous people have to say because they have the solutions on the ground. Um, that will see better results and, and that is um, far more than symbolic. Um, it's a very practical reform. Allegra, a question for you. One of the things that keeps being raised is the so-called lack of detail. We have the design principles, we have a lot of information. What do you say if people raise with you that as a concern, that we need more detail before we can decide on this, whether this power should be granted, we need more detail? Look, um, I, I, what I say is firstly, you know, the thing that we're voting on is the constitutional change and the constitution has to be a principle based document and that's what it's based. Um, if you read the constitution, there's no mention of the prime minister, for example, um, you know, and other sort of details about how we govern um, because it is, it's got to be a flexible document that can take us through the ages. Um, in terms of then, but there are some really important design principles that are absolutely critical and these have been laid out and um, things that it will be made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, for example, that the voice will be made up of that, that will have representations from across the country, um, including young people, including people from remote and regional communities. Um, so those are some of the principles. But the last piece is really about Parliament, because, you know, the, the point on, you know, the constitutional change, the, the final sort of um, piece in the constitutional change is effectively that Parliament will fill in the details. And that's what, in terms of how the voice will operate. And that's what Parliament does. You know, it's appropriate, you know, it would be completely inappropriate to try and put in the constitution vast amounts of details, because frankly, things will change over time. You know, we, and we should expect things to change over time. And Parliament has to react to that. And Parliament has to have that control. And so Parliament has that primacy, primacy in terms of how that detail will be worked out. And, and I think that's, so for me, that's entirely appropriate. We've got what lays out, we've got the kind of principles of how it's laid out. We've got the design principles so we know how it can operate. We actually have a lot of, there are lots of reports about how so the minutiae might work, but we also have parliament um, who will who will finalise the detail and that will change over time, appropriately evolving in the Australian system. Terry, another question that people put and that's caused a lot of controversy is why must the voice or why should it be able to make representations, not just to parliament, but also to the executive. What's your answer to that? Well, I, I mean, I, I've, I've got my answer, but I would, for a start, uh, the very practical reason that that the voice should have access to uh, to the executive and to the government uh, is that that is where policy starts. The debate for policy begins within a department. A minister might say to a department. I, we obviously need to improve on this, so we need a new policy on literacy because it's not working, you know, uh, or there is an aspect of health uh, policy that isn't working or needs to be improved or elevated. Uh, so, so the department, which is part of the executive, works on that policy, hands it to the minister. There's a bit of toing and froing there. The minister ultimately takes the draft legislation for that policy to cabinet. Uh, which is executive government. It's the it's the sort of it's the centre of executive government. It then makes its decision uh, for or against that. But if it decides to approve that legislation, it's then taken to the parliament. It's then debated through both houses of parliament through various committee stages. I mean, this is a very exhaustive process. Uh, and if the if something's urgent, uh, then the parliament will make an effort to to speed up the process. But by and large, it's an exhaustive process, and it comes out the other end. And we all live with that, including those people who've passed it. They then have to justify it if something doesn't quite work. And if the if the parliament or the executive government decides to reject a piece of advice from the voice, they have to live with that because we, the public, if it's reported accurately, as I expect it would be through the parliament, 
um, then we can make up our minds about whether the parliament or whether the government made the right decision. And we we will store that away for the next election, quite possibly. I mean, that's that's democracy. But to come to uh, how uh, one of the reasons that's given why the executive shouldn't be involved is this claim that somehow or other um, specious claims will be brought to uh, specious uh, policy demands will be brought to uh, the executive um, ac across a whole range of things like um, where a naval base should be put mm -hmm. or what sort of paper clips you want in your office. I mean, th these are some of the absurd things that, that are thrown around or parking fines. Um, and, and the people who have been most persuasive on that are those same people I referred to earlier, former Chief Justices, former Justices of the High Court, uh, so Robert French, Kenneth Hayne, um, Anne Toomey and, uh, and George Williams, two of the preeminent um, pre um, academics in this field, uh, Brett Walker, uh, the leading silk in this country on uh, certainly the most in-demand silk in this country on constitutional law, and finally, the Solicitor General. They've all rejected that. They have all rejected it. And to go to, to Allegra's uh, point uh, about, about uh, why it's up to the Parliament to deter, to fill in the gaps, if you like, I mean, so the Constitution, that's this little document here. It's about the size of a passport. That's how big the Constitution is. And that covers, you know, that covers, that, that's the rule book for this nation. That's all of our, all of our, um, all of our institutions of, in our democracy, really, apart from apart from the media, the press is regarded as a pillar of the democracy. But the rule book all comes out of this. Um, Murray Gleeson, another former judge of the High Court who supports the principle of the voice, Murray Gleeson pointed out that uh, that when the original Constitution decided that we should have a High Court, it took two years for the Parliament to determine what form the High Court should have. You know, the founding fathers didn't sit down and, and in writing the Constitution, try to work out what the High Court would be, because to do so would mean that every time you needed to change the High Court in any way, you would have had to go back to the people in another referendum. And as he points out, uh, the, the first Prime Minister of Australia was was on the High Court, which was an utter, utter um, contradiction of the principle of a separation of powers between our, our our political arm and uh, the arm of the judiciary. So uh, it, it, it can confuse some people because they think, oh, I don't understand the law. I don't really understand the constitution. I don't understand how it works. And they might fall easy prey to misinformation like that. But where, you, where something is a bit complex for you and sometimes things are for all of us, where they are, you go to the experts, but you go to the experts who have integrity. You know, you go well, to the one yeah. with credibility. I'm going to exercise my tech skills to the limit by now putting to you some of the questions that have come in. So there are about 20 that have come in. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. I'm just going to pick out a few and I might just let each of you raise your hand if you'd like to take the answer. Okay, this is a good one that's asked a lot. How do you answer the question some voters are asking that this will give Indigenous people special privileges? Thomas? Um, yeah, I'll go. This, uh, this argument that we're going to get special privileges is false uh, or special rights. Um, as, as Kerry mentioned, the Solicitor General said that this uh, enhances our democracy. Um, and so uh, a voice is consistent with how our democracy works. All this constitutional amendment is doing is ensuring that uh, Indigenous people are recognised in the way they seek to be recognised, which is an advisory voice. Um, some people might wonder um, why we say we are voiceless in this country. Um, and I just invite people to think about this. Um, Indigenous people, um, having been connected to this place for more than 60,000 years, um, and where we were 100% of the population pre-colonisation, now we're um, less than 4% of the population. And that 4% of the population is spread across, what is it, over 170 electorates across this great continent. Uh, and so we have very, very little influence on the decisions that are made uh, by parliamentarians. Um, and those decisions um, are specifically about us, some of them, right? So decisions are made specifically about Indigenous peoples, about our lives and our communities. And so what this does, the, the way that it enhances our democracy 
is ensures that a, a, a section of our population, a very small section of our population that has a special connection to this place um, is able to have, um, is able to be heard, um, to simply have a say, an advisory voice when decisions are made about us. And that's just a matter of fairness. It's not a special right. Um, we all have the ability to approach a politician. Um, and this is one more thing to think about in that regard. Um, when you have a lot of Indigenous people living in remote communities uh, where there is um, unreliable power, unreliable internet, um, roads that, um, you know, uh, are, are terrible. Um, when you have people, few people with a driver's license in, in a community, um, you know, uh, and these types of things, it's hard for us to um, participate in this democracy and be heard, you see? So we don't have the same access um, to influence the, the laws and policies that affect us. So that's what this voice addresses. And of it's a problem solving thing. There are plenty of other organisations, corporations and individual, individuals that can and do make representations to the parliament and have been doing so for a very long time. That's right. Very mm -hmm. powerful lobby groups, you know, that have uh, unfettered access to all the, you know, all the way to the prime minister. Indigenous oh. people, you know, with these massive gaps, uh, these very real problems need better access and we'll get better results that way. That's the way democracies work. Thomas, I'm going to ask you, I'm sorry, to deal with the next one as well. This is a common question that's asked. In simplistic terms, why are some Indigenous leaders objecting to the voice if its adop adoption is in the best interests of Indigenous people? I'm just going to interject here a figure that I like repeating ad nauseum, which is that the most recent survey in May this year showed that 83% of Indigenous people support the voice. So correct to say that not all of them do, but the vast majority do. Now, if I could take you to the question, why do some Indigenous people, and particularly some uh, Indigenous leaders who have a party political platform, why do they object to it? Why are they not supporting it? Well, the, the reasons would vary, you know, just like uh, for any group of people. Um, uh, and you've already made the point that we're not homogenous. To think that we all have to agree on something is to dehumanise us, really. Uh, and the reason why we're calling for a voice is so that we have the opportunity to come together and have our debates and discussions about what the solutions are uh, to our problems and then take them forward, uh, you know, in a much more coherent way and, and that will achieve change. But one of the reasons is that we, um, there is very low trust for processes and government just because of uh, the way that we have been treated for a long time. Um, that is one of the reasons. Uh, for those already in the political class, um, such as Senator Thorpe or Senator Price that oppose it, um, it could be because um, they already have a voice. And establishing an official voice from our communities that are accountable to our communities, um, you know, that might be threatening uh, for some people that already have a say. Um, but uh, Indigenous people around the country, as we mentioned at the start, the most... Uh, uh, unanimous support in all of the dialogues was um, for a voice and it's because we uh, not only because we don't want to rely on politicians to get things right because they haven't um, in all of this time but also because we don't want politicians speaking for us uh, because politicians represent electorates uh, not indigenous people and our communities and our culture and our uh, specific issues um, and they're also um, uh, politicians um, are bound to their political party and, uh, and you know, um, other than independence, of course, but um, uh, an independent Indigenous uh, politician does, does not, is, is again, not accountable to Indigenous people and their communities. I'm going to ask each of you this question, and I think I'll make this the last one before, because I really want to close, Thomas, with you reading or reciting the Uluru Statement. This question, I'll just summarise it. Instead of asking how um, Thomas will feel if the voice doesn't get voted in. I would love to know what sustains his hope in the Australian people. I think that's one thing that can be said about the Yes campaign, that it has been relentlessly hopeful. And that is the Yes 23 group. It's Megan Davis and Pat Anderson of the Uluru Dialogue. It's the Wentworth for the Voice group, certainly that I've been involved in. There's so much hope and there's so much optimism. And that's the note that I'd like to end on before we hear from you, Thomas, we hear the Uluru statement. Allegra. What gives you hope that the Australian people will vote yes? 
Um, look, I, I, I actually, I think that the Australian people, deep, you know, want everyone in this country to thrive. I think that sense of a fair go is deeply, deeply held. And I think we actually want the best for, for everyone in this country. And very much that we're very proud of, I think, to be honest, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and history. And we want, you know, that to thrive. So I think that's really, you know, it just comes back to when everyone to have a fair go. And I think this is an opportunity to really live our Australian values. So that's what gives me hope. Kerry, what gives you hope? Well, I, I think a number of things, uh, Nicole, and and um, uh, and uh, interesting that we're in Allegra's seat when I say this, because I think that the last election was a quite extraordinary phenomenon in this country in terms of our our political history. Because I think uh, I think think through generations, uh, many Australians voted as their partners had or as as their parents had. Uh, or they voted as if it was a kind of nuisance in, in many cases. It was just something they had to do because it was uh, compulsory. I think that what we saw, uh, like I've never seen before in the many decades I've been reporting on politics, was people thinking really hard about how they could make their vote count uh, because they were disaffected, they were disillusioned, they were cynical about what their, what their uh, political processes had come to and the failures and the cracks. Uh, in those processes. And if you look at the two major parties in the last election, both of them actually lost ground on their primary votes. Their primary votes crashed. Uh, and although people hailed Labor as having a, a triumphant uh, election win, uh, one reason their win looked as big as it did was because um, the Liberals lost heartland seats to people like Allegra Spender. Uh, and uh, Labor, in fact, lost some of its seats uh, to the Greens because of disaffection with the progressive side of politics. And I think that, that the, the two standout um, voting groups in that were women and young Australians. And I'm looking to women and young Australians, particularly here, to think very hard about what is important to this nation as well as to them uh, in coming up with the right outcome. And the other thing I would say very quickly is that I've felt for a long time now that the public was ahead of the politicians on this. I think certainly from the time the Uluru Statement came out and when it initially received quite a lot of publicity and then sort of back a bit. And I've, I've, I've been exposed to it. I've seen that sentiment expressed in so many different ways in so many different groups around the country uh, where there was this sense that it was the fair thing to do. This sense that after all the talk over decades about wanting reconciliation, that this was the opportunity and this opportunity was being presented to us in a, in a really generous way by Indigenous Australians, not by the political class. Now, we seem to have lost Thomas. Thomas, are you there still? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> All right. I don't feel it's appropriate for any of us to read the Uluru Statement. What I would do is urge everybody listening who hasn't done that to read it and to urge those that you know that are either undecided or considering voting no to read the statement. It's the most powerful, eloquent, moving, beautiful piece of Australian literature really that we should all be very proud of. So I'm going to end on that note. Kerry, Thomas, a huge thank you to you. I don't know where you've disappeared into cyberspace. Kerry, a huge we'll thank be you back. to you. And Allegra, <laughs> a huge thank you to you. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. Thank you so much, Thank Michael. You. And thank you, Kerry and Thomas. Pleasure. Bye-bye.